All right, howdy. So um, I'm going to do a quick survey of Joshua. So if you guys chose to do this, that's great. I really appreciate that you guys chose to do this. Otherwise, you can watch a pod, you can listen to a podcast, you can watch another video, or you can do an actual study uh, within the book of Joshua. But if you chose to do this, this is just going to be me talking a little bit about the overview of the book of Joshua. So that way when we read it, we come to it with an understanding of this is what the original people would have read when they were reading it. So that's kind of the goal of this. So to give us an overview of the book of Joshua, we're going to look at the historical setting. So think of it like a history class, right? It's not like the Bible just takes place in the middle of nowhere with no historical context. There's actual historical context. So culture, warfare, religion, all those things are going to play a role in the book of Joshua. Uh, we're going to see controversies. We're going to look at the different controversies that pop up in the book of Joshua. Uh, which I think are pretty obvious if you understand the book of it. Uh, the theological purpose, so why was it written uh, in terms of why did Moses, or not, not Moses, but why did the people of uh, Israel write this down and record this information, uh, and what did they mean to, to convey about God in this book? Uh, what themes pop up in it? So what underlying themes do we see that are the same throughout the whole story of Joshua? And finally, an application. What is our application of this book today? So to look into the historical context, so we always want to start with the historical context. Because if we go into uh, the Bible and we read it with just our own 21st century eyes, we're going to misunderstand a lot of things and what the purpose of the book was. So we got to look at it and put ourselves in the shoes of the Hebrews as they're walking into the promised land. So what does that mean? Well, here's a couple things. The first thing is that they just came out of uh, Egypt, and they've been wandering in the desert for 40 years. That means one generation would have passed away in between the time of the, the Hebrews being in Egypt and for them entering into the Promised Land. And so remember that they left uh, Egypt, and there's three routes they could have taken. I hold to the traditional route, which means that they would have crossed somewhere over here. They would have headed south to Mount Sinai, which is located in southern Sinai Peninsula. And then they're going to work their way up into the wilderness up here. And from there, they're going to eventually work their way into the northeast and then heading west towards the Promised Land. So they would have been considered invaders out of the east. Eventually, at the end, we're going to see the division of the land. So Joshua, you know, a little bit of a little bit of a heads up what's going to happen. Joshua wins, obviously, and they divide up the promised land by the tribes. And you have different tribes shown right here. You can look that up on your own. I'm not going to take a lot of time here. But just remember that there were the 12 tribes, and each tribe is going to have a judge after Joshua, and these tribes are going to divide up the land. The only tribe that doesn't get land is the Levites. The Levites are the priests, if you remember. And so they're the ones that are in charge of performing the sacrifices, performing the religious rites of the Hebrews, and so they get land in every single city in the tribes, so that that way they can be a uh, uh, go-between between God and the people of God. Historical setting, looking at some of the details that surround the Bible, so not just looking at the Bible itself, but looking at sources outside of the Bible, archaeology, other texts, uh, and we know that they're entering into the land of Canaan. Now, some quick significance for that. Uh, remember that uh, this is around the 1400s BC or the 1200s BC. So there's two different dates for that, depending on how early you think the Exodus happens. Uh, for me, I think it's the 1400s, because there was a lot of uprisings around that time. Egypt begins to lose its power around that time. Egypt was very weak by the 1200s. But I think that it happened towards the beginning of the decline of the Egyptians. Uh, some significant, event, significant events around this, remember the Exodus occurs, uh, Moses uh, passes away and he hands off his right to leadership to Joshua, who had been his disciple, essentially. And then uh, this is right before the time of the judges, so each tribe having its own leader. We have a shift from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. So that means that tools are now becoming, warfare is now becoming more advanced. It's not only just bronze weapons, but it's also some people who are finally discovering the iron weapons are starting to have an advantage over those people who are using bronze weapons. I mean, think of it practically. You're, you're clashing swords with your enemy, and suddenly your sword breaks. Well, what's going to happen? You're probably going to die. You're probably going to lose. So those who had iron weapons were more likely to win, 
And so this is kind of that transition period when some uh, empires begin to rise because they have better technology than the other empires. We see a decline in Egypt's power. At this time period in the Promised Land, there are Canaanite city-states. So if you've ever studied anything about Greece and you heard about the city-states, it's the same idea. Each city was basically its own sovereign location. It's not like there's an empire uniting multiple cities. There's just individual cities. And so they're kind of on their own. That's why when the Israelites come in, or the Hebrews come in, they are able to overpower the cities because they're not all united as one nation in the same way that the Hebrews were. So the Hebrews were many tribes in one nation, whereas the Canaanites were more of cities scattered throughout the Promised Land. So they're kind of, it's, it's the same idea as divide and conquer. You, do, you divide up the, the power of the people, and then you overtake each city one by one. And that's what we see in the book of Joshua. And then finally, we have the Canaanite religion. And this is going to play a role in the, the reason why God commands those the Hebrews as they go in to wipe out that, that uh, civilization. And it's because they worshipped Baal, which was for them the lord of fertility. Uh, and what you see behind me, this is a temple to Baal at that time period. And this included fertility rites, which I'm not going to go a lot into details about that, but it was a very bad thing. Uh, it, was, it was inappropriate relationships between men and women. And then we also have the child sacrifice, which is occurring in that time period. So think about it. For them, they believe the only way to please Baal and the other gods was to sacrifice their own children during that time period. And that's actually unique to the Hebrews that they did not perform child sacrifice. So that's one of the things that sets them apart from the other cultures, is they're unwilling to sacrifice their children just to please uh, a god to get a good harvest or something like that. So that's that plays into why does God tell them to go out and wipe out those, those civilizations. Theological purpose. What was the point of Joshua? Well, in a theological sense, it was four to 500 years after Abraham. So that's during the time of Abraham's covenant. Abraham's covenant is still there, and we still need to fulfill that covenant. But how are we going to do that? And so Abraham uh, is promised a people, he's promised a place, and he's promised a presence. So the people, his, his, his descendants would be as numerous as the stars in the night sky. And his place would be the place that he stood when that promise was made, um, which is going to be in the promised land that they're currently located in. The Canaanites currently own that. And then finally, presence. God is going to be with him. And how is he going to fulfill that? Well, we're going to see that uh, with Moses as he creates the tabernacle. Right? The tabernacle is a place where God dwells among his people, and the Levites carry out that, that presence. The Canaanites were uh, descendants, so going back even further, so this is the time of Noah now for a second. Uh, going back even further, Ham, which was a son of Noah, is going to be the, um, the, the father of the Canaanites and the Egyptians. And his name actually means to be humbled. It's a prediction of what's going to happen to his descendants, in reference to Shem. Shem means name, so it's the name of Israel. They're going to come in, and they're going to humble Ham's descendants. And Ham, if you remember, was cursed by Noah. Shem was blessed by Noah. And so we're going to see the outcome of that cursing and that blessing here in the book of Joshua. So Joshua is fulfilling not only the promise to Abraham, but also the promise to Noah, or the promise that Noah made, I should say. So what's the key purpose here? The key purpose is to show that God kept his covenant promise, to bring the Israelites into the land he had shown to Abraham. That's the whole point of this, is to show that God is keeping his promise and he's going to be present within that promise. It's not just, here, I'm going to leave you on your own. you got to fulfill that promise on your own. Remember, God walks through, walks through the sacrifice that Abraham makes and says, if I don't keep my promise, this is what's going to happen to me. So I'm going to keep my promise. And it takes hundreds of years for that to happen. God works in his own timing. We see that over and over again in the New Testament, the Old Testament, and even today. Some key themes from this. Behind me you see uh, what would have been um, the, the part of the promised land, part of Canaan. Some key themes we see throughout the book. The first one is going to be covenant and land. God is going to keep his covenant with his people. The only catch is that they have to also keep their covenant with him. So if they keep their covenant, he's going to give them their land. They get to keep the land. Keeping the covenant equals keeping the land. Uh, the ban of Canaan, that's another theme. The whole throughout we see over and over again the idea of totally destroying them, to show mercy. And this was actually a holy 
thing for them. The, the word that's used here is actually to, to consecrate the land. And to consecrate it meant to wipe out those people. And we're going to see why that was a holy thing back then. And remember, we don't want to take this and say that, oh, then this means that we're allowed to perform jihad. In other words, holy war. We're not allowed to go out and wipe out entire civilizations just because Joshua did. This is a unique setting a specific time and a specific place. This is not justification for a holy war today in 2000, in the year 2000. There were two exceptions to this rule, though, this ban. Uh, the first exception was Rahab. If you remember, she helped the spies out, so she is an exception to that. Another one is the Gibeonites, who tricked Joshua into making a, a, a treaty with them. So we see exceptions, and we see that God's ultimate purpose is to bring these people into his covenant, into his people. And that's kind of a foreshadowing of what's going to happen when Jesus comes along. It's not just meant for just the Hebrews. The promise, the covenant is not just for the Hebrews. It's for everybody. Now, there are some rules to being a part of that promise, which you're going to have to follow, but we see that the Canaanites are unwilling to follow that. And so God comes in as the divine warrior. We don't see this highlighted enough in New Testament. We see this when we, when, we, when we hear in our church, when we hear uh, in our Bible studies, we don't hear of God as divine warrior. He's, this, he's the Yahweh who made the earth, and the earth is going to submit to him one way or another. The problem is some of the people have turned away from God in a very, very harmful way, not only for them, but for the people around them. And we're going to look at that in just a second with, their, with the worship of Baal. And you're going to see why Baal and Yahweh constantly go to war throughout the Old Testament. And it's not so much that Yahweh is going to fight him and there's a chance that Baal might win. It's more of Yahweh owns Baal. And if Baal worship is happening, there's going to be consequences to that. And those people who worship Baal need to instead worship Yahweh, not something that is fake, an idol. So, uh, and then finally, the, the last theme that we see throughout the story is that we are all better together. We've, we've seen that in, our, uh, in one of our themes here at Faith, and we also see that here in Joshua, that we are better together. The tribes are better together. Some controversies. The first controversy is the genocide of the Canaanites. Don't get me wrong, it's a genocide. They're, they're seeking out to destroy the people uh, of Canaan. This is their curse from Noah. Uh, the reason for this, what are some reasons for the genocide? And again, we've got to be we've got to be direct with this. We don't want to beat around the bush because you're going to see this brought up in uh, places outside the school. So why did this happen? Well, number one, fertility rights. Fertility rights were a bad thing. Inappropriate relationships between men and women. That was one part of this. Um, a way that they worshipped Baal was to commit these um, inappropriate relationships with each other in large groups. Uh, another part of the problem was child sacrifice. That's the number one thing that I see as why did God judge these people? So God comes in as judge, not necessarily as, as a, oh, it's okay, pat on the back, little slap on the wrist, you're going to be okay. It's, no, you're sacrificing your children to get a better crop. That's not how this works. I desire love, not sacrifice. And so God says, you've had your time to repent. You knew me when you, when you knew Noah, and you decided to turn away from me. And so because of this refusal to acknowledge God, and instead turn to Baal, they are going to, they, because they sacrificed these children, the Israelites did not want to be a part of that. God did not want the Israelites to be a part of that. And so we see this with uh, Akan, who his family decides to hide some of the worshippers of Baal, which the Canaanites, and we see that this is God sees that this religion as a parasite, this false religion as a parasite. And so he doesn't want his people to be infected by this parasite. So what do you do if you're infected with some sort of disease? Let's say you get bit by a snake. You don't have any way to uh, remove the poison. Well, the best way to do it is just to chop off the arm. Get rid of it before it kills the whole person. It's better to lose the arm than your life. And it's the same way here with false religion. It's better to lose these people before... The whole country turns towards the worship of, of Baal, and suddenly everyone's sacrificing their children, and suddenly everyone's committing these fertility rites, and suddenly everyone's worshiping a false god who's going to lead them down the path of destruction, really. 
And those people were in decline before the Hebrews came along. And where do we see this? Well, we see it most in the golden calf incident. So Moses and Mount Sinai, they start worshiping the golden calf. This is where we see the justification for a false religion as a parasite. It starts with one person and it spreads to many. And so God does not want to allow this to happen. So not only does he get rid of the Canaanites, he gets rid of any Hebrews who start to turn towards the gods of the Canaanites because the gods of the Canaanites required sacrifice, human sacrifice, which the Hebrew religion the religion of the Jews, the religion of Christianity, we would never turn to that sort of sacrifice. All right, that concludes.